have a good time Put a smile on your face, yeah Can't be caring Relation Radio mm-hmm. Even brighten your day And help you through the night Bring you good music Can't be caring Relation Radio And here's your host And now it's time for our Faithful Financial Moments with Sister Sharon Richard. This is Sharon Richard with your Faithful Financing Moment. Creating a budget is critical to achieving your financial goals. While creating a budget does require a few hours of your time, I am certain that you will find that it is not a very difficult process. Still, even after you've created the budget, what's so important is that you stay faithful to it. During this time of COVID-19, we we have probably all been distracted, particularly as we have been in our homes for more hours of the day than we might be tempted to, to spend money in places where otherwise we might not have. So we have to be careful. 
it's certainly easy to 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 kind of fall into the ease of of getting online and and buying things through Amazon and things show up the next day. Um, why don't you pause for a minute and just take an extra day before you execute that purchase? You don't want to get into a situation where you're spending a lot more money over and above your budget simply because of the ease by which uh, you're able to purchase and to get it quickly. You also want to remember that you have an opportunity now to potentially allocate savings. As more of us are home and we're not able to get out as much as we were before, that's an opportunity where you may have some excess cash that otherwise you would not have had. So you want to take this opportunity to save more money than perhaps you would have in your original budget. Another thing to consider is you don't want to get distracted from your goals as a whole. You still want to keep your eye on whatever goals you set, regardless of what may be going on in the world around us. You still want to be focused and, and stay committed to the goals that you have set for yourself. Maybe you wanted to pay off your debt. Um, perhaps, um, you know, cash flow may be tighter as a result of COVID-19, but you can still adjust and do your best to, to pay down your debts as much as possible. Although this may be a challenging time for all of us, it doesn't have to take you away from the goals that you have set for yourself. You also want to take advantage of low interest rates where you can. Many of the fixed-rate mortgages are at an all-time low, and so it may be a great opportunity to refinance your home mortgage. And then above all, through it all, try not to stress. Uh, as, as you know, according to the word, God says, be anxious for nothing. With all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request known unto him. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and mind. Give any concerns you have regarding your financial position over to him, and he will direct you, he will guide you, he will bring you through. This is Sharon Richard with your Faithful Financing Moment. Up next, Nina Taylor with Your Gospel News followed by the Pastor's Corner with Elder Ernest Richard, Jr., Apostle Irvin Whitlow, and Apostle Vincent Smith and Company. Hi, everybody. I'm Nina Taylor, and here is this week's Gospel News. Contemporary gospel artist Desmond Pringle, a tenor vocalist, has served as pastor, worked as an A&R executive, and has written, produced, and recorded with well over a dozen of his contemporaries. Raised in a Pentecostal household in Charleston, South Carolina, Pringle was active in church and took roles in several gospel musicals. After an early 90s move to Chicago, he entered the music industry by writing material for T.D. Jakes and Reverend Clay Evans. Additionally, he recorded with Yolanda Adams and Twinkie Clark and is among the voices heard on R. Kelly's I Believe I Can Fly. Pringle's own albums have been few and far between. The self-released Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs in 1999 recorded live in Chicago on the National Day of Prayer, which was his debut. Each recording that follows made an impact on Billboard's gospel charts. Loyalty from Tommy Boy Records in 2001, his most successful release, peaked at number nine and was followed by Be Still in 2006. Fidelity in 2013. During the latter half of the 2010s, he continued to work with other artists. Pringle released singles such as Let's Adore Him and Get Us Through. To describe Nia Allen's music is to describe the sound of pure, passionate worship. Nia is one of the generation's fresh talents, leading the way in praise and worship. She has traveled as a background vocalist with C.C. Winans, Nicole C. Mullen, David and Nicole Binion, and many others. She is a reoccurring guest on TBN's Praise the Lord program Program and is continually gaining national and international exposure within the realm of praise and worship. Nia has led worship for C.C. Winans, Always Sisters Forever Brothers, Youth Conferences, the National Worship Leaders Conference, and is currently traveling with the Women of Faith Conference, ministering to over 10,000 women every weekend. The ministry God has given Nia goes beyond singing. She's a songwriter and a teacher. 
In the month of May, we'll celebrate African American authors and their contributions to American literature. In spite of spending much of her life enslaved, Phyllis Wheatley was the first African American and second woman after Anne Bradstreet to publish a book of poems. Born around 1753 in Gambia, Africa, Wheatley was captured by slave traders and brought to America in 1761. Upon arrival, she was sold to the Wheatley family of Boston, Massachusetts. Her first name, Phyllis, was derived from the ship that brought her to America, the Phyllis. The Wheatley family educated her, and within 16 months of her arrival in America, she could read the Bible, Greek and Latin classics, and British literature. She also studied astronomy and geography. At the age of 14, Phyllis Wheatley began to write poetry, publishing her first poem in 1767, publication of an elegiate poem on the death of the celebrated divine George Whitfield in 1770, which brought her great notoriety. In 1773, with financial support from the English Countess of Huntington, Phyllis traveled to London with the Wheatley's son to publish her first collection of poems, poems on various subjects, religious and moral, the first book written by a black woman in America. It included a foreword signed by John Hancock and other Boston notables, as well as a portrait of Wheatley, all designed to prove that the work was indeed written by a black woman. She was emancipated shortly after. Here's this week's Gospel Top 10 Songs. Number 10, Ty Tribbett. Anyhow, Brian Courtney Wilson at number 9, Steel. Tasha Cobb Leonard, In Spite of Me, at number 8. 7, CeCe Winans, Never Lost. 6, Byron Cage, I Can't Give Up. 5, The Clock Sisters and Snoop Dogg with His Love. 4, Mia Allen, Wait. 3, Corinne Hawthorne, Speak to Me. Joe Kia has number two, which means our new number one song. And for the fourth week, Pastor Mike Jr. with I Got It. Well, that's your top ten songs, your tribute to African American authors, and your gospel news. I'm Nina Taylor, reminding you to connect with me on all social media outlets. You can find all my outlets on my website at msninataylor.com. Now, let's get back to more great gospel music on this great station. Hello, I'm Nina Taylor, your Gospel News reporter, and you're listening to The Pastor's Corner with my friend, Elder Ernest Richard, on Elation Radio. Let's start with that lovely lady 
in St. Louis, Missouri. Amen. The lovely Dr. Kim Robinson, better known as Kenny Kim. Come on, say something to us. Hello there. This is the Pastor's Corner, and I'm looking forward to um, to some feasts. Let's do it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We must get on our way in. We must stop in another place and see if there's another lovely lady on the line that we call the quiet storm. And so we want to know, is Pastor Anna Henderson on the line tonight? Hey, Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is the man that blesses in him. I'm so glad to be a part of this podcast on tonight. God bless you all. Amen. Uh, our Apostle Irvin Whitlow is hosting a great revival there in Georgia, and we pray that it is going well and that the power of God is flowing like never before. Amen. Uh, are there any uh, Sister G. Johnson? Amen. Are you with us tonight? Okay, we don't hear anything from this G. Amen. Are there any others that are online tonight that I am not aware of? Please make yourself known. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Um, It's just a blessing to be on the line tonight with everyone. Amen. That's that Georgia peach by way of <laughs> Indianapolis, Minister Paula Henderson. Forgive me, little sis. Amen. I should have known to call your name. Amen. You forgive me. That's this young man not thinking in the full capacity that he needs to think. But we're so glad to have you with us on the podcast tonight. Ain't that well? There has been much of a discussion for several weeks now under a theme, deliverance is a process. Ain't that brought to us by the host of this show. Deliverance is a process. And we have talked about that much, hate that, and we're going to talk about it tonight. And I believe he said we're going to try to bring it to closure tonight, hate that, with this uh, particular subject. And so we're going to ask at this time, we're going to ask Kimmy Kim, please give us a word of prayer. Hey, man, someone get the scripture ready. Hey, man, and uh, we shall Amen. go into our discussion. Father God, thank you once again for another good day. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Father God, for making ways out of no way. Father God, as we continue on this wonderful feast, give us a, um, a fellowshipping that we need so that we can learn from each other and clean from each other. Father God, we thank you for this podcast. We pray and hope that um, whatever is said will be uplifting and um, can help those who are in need of a good word or who is not understanding the per- the um, way of your ways. And, Father God, I know that there are times when we can, um, you know, sometimes forget your ways, but I'm still reminded that the word is so amazing, the work continue on reproofing us, correcting us. The word gives us hope. Um, The word gives us joy in the midst of sorrow. So, Father God, thank you so much for the Pastor's Corner. It is an amazing, amazing podcast, and I make this 
prayer in your son Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Someone that has our scripture, please read it for us. All right. I guess everybody is wondering where we're at. We were in the book of Romans. I believe it was in the book of Romans. Okay. What book? What was the? Um, let's see. Romans. Okay. I believe that's where we were at. We were in Romans, the seventh chapter, but then I believe okay. that we had moved into the eighth chapter. Lord have mercy. Well, there he is, the host of the show, Bishop Desmond Ernest E. Richard Jr. Let's get a hand clap for him. I guess the hand clap button is open. My well, by the way, your phone was unmuted all that time, so it wasn't me. <laughs> all right, anybody have our scripture? I have. Together, Lord. You know, we well, are well. So you have another example of this. Hello? Hello? We're here. I think there's something wrong with him, his phone. So, um, yeah, we he, will continue. I think he was transferred, uh, transferred from the car and getting out. Oh, uh, okay. 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 okay, while we're waiting on the scripture, I'm going to do this. Uh, Minister Paula, somebody... If you're close to your computer, uh, look up the word deliverance and look up the word process. Let us get a definition of those two, deliverance and process. I tell you what, Minister Henderson, if you can look up deliverance, uh, Dr. Mm-hmm. Kim, if you can start process, and we can move a little more uh, expedient, uh, and, and let's look at those two, and then uh, we're going to talk about that for a minute, grab our scripture, and then Bishop Desmond is going to take over. Okay. I have deliverance. Um, deliverance is defined as the action of being rescued or set free. The act and of being rescued or set free. Okay. Yes. Okay. And what is process? I Process. Is defined as a series of actions or steps taken in order to achieve a particular end. Okay. Okay. It is a series of steps. I just want to shorten that up. It's a series of steps to get to the goal or the intended goal, I should say. Yes. All right, so it said deliverance, to be rescued or set free. Okay, if that's the definition, to be rescued. How do we process a rescue? What are the steps to a uh, to a rescue? Mm-hmm. 
Well, first oh, no, you have you, to know that I, you have to have recognition that there's an issue. Okay, um, you got to recognize an issue. That's a good one. Let's hold on to that. All right, somebody else. What are the steps to a rescue? The second, uh, at some point you have the knowledge that there is an answer to the problem. There is a solution to acknowledge that there is a solution to the problem. Okay, so the first person said you have to assess the problem, and then it is said you got to have a solution to the problem. What are you saying, Dr. Kim, about deliverance? This word rescue. I I really um, believe, like, rescue, another thing is to understand that you need help. Oh, the need of, the the need of knowing that you need help. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. To, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To admit, there it goes. To admit yes. that help is needed. Yes. Now, assess the problem. Admit that there is help needed. And then find a solution to it all. Now, that sounds like good to a good rescue to a great deliverance. Now, let's take that on a spiritual walk. How do we relate that to salvation? How do we relate that to our discussion? Somebody talk to me. Just that word deliverance, rescue, freedom. How do we relate that rescue together to our Somebody talk to me. All oh, my ears are hurting. Apostle, you know, how you I doing? Think we're... Is everybody on mute? No, everybody's not on mute. No. I'm just get to a point where I can actually even be heard. But go ahead and answer the question, and uh, we're going to get in here with you because, I mean, you know, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was just going to say, we, I believe we were in Romans 8 where it said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after, after the flesh but after the spirit. So we can relate that to salvation and that, you know, when you are in need of deliverance, there is a way out. Um, and the way out is through Jesus Christ. That's the solution. Um, so you don't have to really stay in that same condition when you, you know, recognize, hey, I need help, or you recognize there is an issue. The solution is through Christ. Because Christ did die for us, then now there is no condemnation to them who are in Christ, but you have to be in Christ. If the scripture says you have to be in Christ, then that right. means your only solution or your only help to the problem is Christ himself. Exactly. Is that what it says? Exactly. Amen. Amen. All right. And let's answer to this other word, and then we need to give it to Bishop Desmond because this is his ship, and he's the captain, and he's on the air. And so we want to look quickly at this word process. It means to take steps. So let's put definition one or word one together with word two, then we are processing ourselves into deliverance. Question, does that mean that salvation
equation doesn't work. Anybody, no, it does. No, it actually does not. No. Um, let's let me let, let me go ahead and jump in here, and uh, to those of you who are on the panel, uh, um, I appreciate you being here. You're sharper than you're reacting today for whatever the reason. And I'm not scolding. I'm just saying in love. Let God use you the way he has in the past. So let go and let God. Let's get to the issue here. When we're talking about the identification, deliverance is a process, we have to understand something. Let's go from the leadership standpoint first and foremost. How are your parishioners to uh, be identified with you as a leader, if you're sitting there acting like nothing is ever wrong, you never have any problems, you never go through any situations, you never have circumstances, you never have any type of persecution, no ostracism, no criticism, and then yet when they see you do something wrong according to the quote-unquote flesh, we'll start judging them and say they won't never save, they ain't even satisfied. How do we identify? Paul takes the time to identify with the common struggles that we deal with. Now, here's the issue. We come to the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask him to be the Lord of our life. God saves us. It is not our flesh that gets saved. It is our spirit that is cleansed. It is our spirit that is purified. It is our spirit spirit that becomes justified. It is our spirit that walks in righteousness. Our flesh can't do any doggone thing except be what it is, our flesh. Therefore, here's where the struggle comes in. Here's where the battle comes in. I don't know what people may be going through. There are people who are listening to us right now that are dealing with drug addiction. There are people who are dealing with alcoholism. There are people who are dealing with sex demons. There are people who are dealing with low self-esteem. There are so many things that people are dealing with, and they're struggling with it. Deliverance, I'm trying to make them understand, is a process. Paul pulled it out the best when he started talking about it uh, in verses, and I can go down to verse uh, 17, but I'm not going to get into the entire scripture. But what I am going to say is that Paul talks about a time where he finds himself in a position where, as a leader, he's looking to do the right thing. He's looking to say the right thing. He's looking to have the characteristics that belong to him, that were given to him by God. And yet he finds himself in a battle with his flesh. And honestly speaking, folks, let's go to the top of this thing. The battle really does. It begins in your flesh, yes, but the real war is actually fought in your mind. Why do you think he said to the Romans, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind? Because your mind is kind of feeding signals to your flesh of things that the world used to do before you got saved. And that's all your mind knows until you begin to transform your mindset. As long as you're going to walk in a worldly mindset, you are going to do worldly things. And until you go to the mind of Christ and hold the thoughts, the feelings, and the purposes of his heart, that's when the transformation begins. I'm talking about my Sunday message already. Let me get up off of that. Anyway, the bottom line is simply this. We have to recognize there is a clear-cut battle and a clear-cut difference between our spirit and and our flesh. We don't want to get super spiritual with this thing. We want to keep this where the calves can get theirs, because where the calves can eat, because the cows are going to get Does that make sense to anybody? Talk to me. Well, that, Amen. That's why, that, that's why I may mention in the outset, uh, that's why the question came up, does salvation work? And the answer is yes. Yes. If there are fleshly, mental, and, and, and sometimes personal things that we deal with, we are struggling with, that either in our receiving salvation or since we got saved, we ran into that becomes the struggle. Amen. It becomes. 
comes to struggle, and sometimes it is a struggle because of spiritual immaturity. Amen. Sometimes that the babies run with no pampers on. Come on now. Sometimes in the church we are guilty of letting the babies make noise, but it's really the baby saying, I'm cutting teeth. Can somebody help me here? My thumbs are hurting. Come on we, now. We, 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 you know, we, we, let, we, we let people come to Christ, but then we don't really teach them. You have been delivered. The thing that you're struggling with is your mind, your flesh, and your emotion. All three of them. All three of them. Somebody else is going to say something? Ladies, why are we so quiet tonight? Why is thy soul so disquieted within thee? <laughs> Come on now, you already understand this. You've been alive for a number of years. You've not... I wish I could sit here and say I'm, I've been holy all my life. I've crossed too many I's and dotted too many T's. And we all understand life in and of itself. Sometimes we have to get down to where the rubber meets the road. Let's get down there. Come on, y'all. I know you got it in you. Because if one of y'all tells me you've been saved since the day you was born, I'm getting some oil, I'm coming to your house, and we're going to get you saved first and anoint you afresh. Come on here. Talk to me. <laughs> well, you know, I'm listening to what you were saying earlier, and um, and I, I think you said it because you were saying that the flesh did not get saved, and that is scripture. You know, when we got saved, our spirit was reborn, you know, was regenerated. Our flesh did not get born again. If we went down in baptism, which the Bible tells us to be buried with him in baptism, when we when we come out of that water, our, our flesh is still the same flesh. If you had a corn on your toes, they say when you got out of the water, you still had a corn on your flesh. You still had the same color hair and all of that. Your flesh did not get saved. You know, Amen. Your spirit got saved and was reborn again when you have the Holy Spirit. That is the part that got regenerated. That is the part that got born again. Uh, the struggle that we are talking about, and I believe uh, what, you, what we are saying, uh, is that the struggle is not in the spirit, but the struggle is in the flesh, is with this That's flesh, right. because we are we have these earthly tabernacles. And the Bible says that there's no good thing that dwelleth in this flesh, in this flesh. And so the battle is between the regenerated man that has been born again and the fleshly nature. Uh, we are dealing with the battle of the flesh because even in Galatians 5, it talks about the works of the flesh, you know, so that lets us know that there's there's the fruit of the spirit, but then you have the works of the flesh. And then in Romans eight, in this eighth chapter, in that verse thirteen, it says, "For we, if we live after the flesh, he shall die. But if through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God." That's what our Amen. goal is. We are aiming to continue to walk in the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we do with this flesh? We got to mortify it. We got to put it to death. That's the process of putting this flesh to death. And the process is bringing our flesh into um, uh, into alignment with, with, the, with the spirit man. Our flesh wants to do its thing, but we got to call. We got to kill the old the old things of the flesh and bring it into divine alignment with the born-again man of God, with the born-again spirit of God on the inside. So even though we have been born again, as you said, the mind still has remembrance of some of the things that it used to do. Like I think you mentioned in one of the cases that if you were a cusser, sometimes when you get upset, you might that old man might want to use some of those old words because, see, that memory of some of those things is still there. You're constantly putting those things to death, but they don't. Some of the memory of the of those of the past is still there. So then you say, "Oh wait a minute, I'm I'm, I'm new. Uh, this is not the deed of the the new man. So I gotta mortify that. I can't I can't do that anymore. I can't use those kind of words. I'm gonna have to humble myself and do this thing according to the word of God." So you're constantly bringing that flesh under subjection to the word and the will of God, and that is the battle. Is bringing that flesh what the flesh would have done 
I hear people say, well, if I wasn't saved, I would have did this. If I wasn't saved, I would have did that. But now that I am saved, I have to put on the new man. That means I've got to kill those old, old ideals of what I did back then or what I would have done because now I'm born again. So the struggle is constantly in that flesh of bringing that flesh to integrate that, that flesh into alignment with the word of God, bringing it into alignment and saying, this is how I am now to walk as a born again believer because the flesh doesn't want to, it's not, it's not conformable to the word of God. You have to kill this flesh. You got to die. This flesh got to die in order to walk in the newness of God. So the battle of this process is dealing with that flesh on a daily basis. And that's why I believe that this is an overcoming way over here in Zion, that every day we are overcoming. Every day the word is revealing to us who we are, and we are putting off that old man, and we're saying, wait a minute, that doesn't line up with this word. Let me get rid of that. I had an idea, or I had a thought, or I had a I did this or that. Oh, wait a minute. That's not supposed to be a part of me. Let me get rid of this. Let me get. So you're constantly being washed in this word, and the word should constantly be revealing something to you that you are changing because this flesh is going to be changing until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And that's the battle. The battle is bringing this flesh under subjection, called, bringing this flesh to die, uh, caught, you know, um, by the word of God. How do you kill it? By aligning it to the word of God, dragging those things at the cross, keeping it under the blood of Jesus, and then picking up the word of God and living this word out according to the word. But if you don't know the word, and if you don't have the spirit of God, then you don't have the ability to make the changes that's necessary for you to walk in the new man and, and to live as a son or the daughter of Christ. So that's the battle. The battle, to me, is the flesh. And you're exactly right. Here's where we're dealing with. See, and I like that you took the time to explain to those who are listening, and I want to first of all take the time, because we failed to do this, to in, to just uh, thank those of you by way of social media, whether it's Facebook, and I want to welcome especially uh, TikTok. Uh, we just decided to start doing it tonight. So we want to welcome the TikTok audience as well as our radio audience, wherever you may be and wherever you may be listening. Thank you all for tuning in. But, sis, getting back to what you just got finished sharing with us, to the individual who comes to realize that there is a battle in their flesh or a battle in their mind, let's go right where it all begins, and they find themselves doing the very thing that they have no real desire to do, but, uh, and I, okay, I guess I'm going to have to talk real, real raw. And so for those of you watching by way of social media, by listening by way of radio, I'm not going here to prove anything to anybody. I'm only going here so that people can get an understanding. To the individual that has heavy-duty sexual habits, now you read between the lines because I'm trying to be as holy as I can in what I said, to the individual that has those, quote, unquote, holy sensual habits, those habits that they've been trying to change for God knows how long, and they're just not able to change it. And uh, if I need to be more specific, I'm more or less talking about when they find themselves bringing pleasure to themselves. Again, read between the lines. They're trying to receive deliverance from that, and yet they find themselves constantly, continuously, because of how good they think it feels to them, they're constantly in it. Or let's go one more. To the individual who gets saved, wants to stop drinking, gives up wine, gives up beer, but is having difficulty giving up liquor. These issues are what I'm talking about because, people, we have real struggles. And we as church folk got to stop dancing around the struggles that the people are meeting. People are coming to church as a hospital. Why do you think most people come to the hospital? Because the preacher's good? Because the choir's good? Because they like the ushers at the door? Because the hospitality crew treats them right? A lot of them are coming to church because they need deliverance. They need answers. They need something that's going to set them free from themselves. 
And so why is it that we, the body of Christ, will dance around these things and not meet these things head on and call a thing a thing and deal with it the way it is? We don't want to share our testimonies. A lot of us want to make people think we've been saved since we first hit the face of this earth. Now, I I don't mind telling my story, not to glorify what I used to do, but to make somebody listening understand that if God did it for me, he can do it for you. End of story. Any comments? Well, I think think it, it, it is good for people to know that once you get into salvation, uh huh. There will be battles and struggles with certain issues that you have not quite let go of or have walked yourself into since you have gotten saved. But they All right. need to understand just because you walk into something or get into something, it does not mean it has become a part of you for the rest uh-huh. of your life. Amen. It, 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 it may come, but you can get rid of it. And I think, Amen. Uh, and I think uh, even though it was a secular song, but I think Teddy P said it best. You just got uh-huh. to let it go. Yes. You can't. And here, here's another thing. You can't claim you want to be delivered and keep hanging around the same situation. Say that one more time, Apostle. You cannot claim to want to be delivered or claim that you got delivered and keep hanging around the same situation. You got delivered from alcohol, but you're going to keep hanging with those that drink. You got delivered from cigarettes, but yet you're in a smoky room every day. You say you got delivered from sex, but yet you're saying you're still hanging around the crowd at work that likes to joke about nasty things or, or, or nasty conversations. I shouldn't say nasty things, but nasty conversations for those of us that are saved. But yet right. you're still there, and that spirit of love stay on you as long as you stay where it is. Amen. And, and this is the, the, the good, I mean, I, somebody else is about to say something, but this is the, the centrality uh, of what we're talking about when we say deliverance is a process. And I only say it's a process because there are a lot of things God will deliver you from immediately. But then there are some things that will take a little bit of time. Now, in the fruits of the Spirit, I think one of them, somebody help me out here. Maybe I don't know what I'm talking about. Is self-control considered to be part of the fruits of the Spirit? Yeah. Okay. Amen. Yes, so, it is. Okay, so would self-control tell you that there are some things God is going to take care of, but then there are some things you have to take care of? If you know that it's a sin to sleep with another man's wife, if you know it's a sin to inject your body with various poisons that we call drugs, and yet you do it, who has control over that? Talk to me, somebody. And we have blessed quiet again. The, the, the person well, we were talking I would try to have somebody talking. else to read. Go ahead. I heard somebody. Well, I was just going to say that part of, part of the process, since we're talking about deliverance being a process, part of that process is, is having a willingness to surrender to the process, mm-hmm. okay. whatever the process is that takes that it takes to get you out of that situation. Because if you're in quicksand and you're sinking, you want someone to get you out of that, no matter what the process is, because it will save you from you know. But now, you know, your destiny. You if right you didn't get saved, 
And I, let me hold mm-hmm. you right there for a minute. You said something very valuable, and people need to hear this. If you are in quicksand and you are sinking, you want to be delivered immediately. How does that deliverance from, and we'll use quicksand, how do you get immediate deliverance from quicksand? Do you not make a decision that, okay, I'm in the wrong place. I've got to do something to get out of here. I need a little help. Is that how we do it? Talk to me. Explain to me. How do I, with the quicksand theory, find a way to go about initiating the deliverance that I need? Talk to me. Well, I mean, the first, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go. Well, one thing for sure, if you're in quicksand, you better start hollering help and get the attention on you that you're thinking in quicksand. Thank you. You got to Thank you, Apostle. You got to acknowledge. No, I'm saying thank you, Apostle. Keep talking. Keep talking. And, and the thing about it is, is that, uh, we, we sort of established this in the beginning. If you don't acknowledge the problem, who's going to be able to help you? Uh, yes. Yes. Come on. I mean, you, you, even if we see it and say something ain't right, but if you don't admit that I, I, I'm struggling, with porno, I'm struggling with with this or or, or with this. Sometimes let's not even go that strong. Sometimes people are struggling with not talking so much. Uh-huh. They're struggling. They're struggling not trying to be the head honcho so much. Not trying to be the one that got to be in charge so much. So some All people right. feel like. Even even in the family, some people feel like ain't nothing supposed to happen unless I said so. Ah, oh, boy. Thus we have that, yet another. That's, that's a problem because that's a spirit called control. That's exactly what that is, the spirit called control. Any one of you ladies want to throw something in there for us? Either. Amen. I just think I, I agree when you said, um, what do you do? You know, you definitely cry out SOS, you know, help. You know, this is an immediate emergency uh, surrendering because you're looking for help at all costs. Um, I'm also thinking about it as I'm listening to the discussion is that that's why it's so important that the church be the church. Mm-hmm. We get off of the church uh, as far as uh, blame or anything like that because I don't believe that when we talk about totality uh, of the church, uh, we, we, we want to be careful how we phrase phrase our comments because, you know, not every church is doing uh, the same thing. So there are some churches that are actually walking people through processes, you know what I'm saying, and walking people through their challenges. But I, I do want to say that it is so important that we as believers that we are patient with one another, that we have the love of God so that we can help each other. I think transparency is so important. I think you said that early in the beginning, you sharing your testimony. And I think that was one of the powerful things of the church uh, is that when people began to share their testimony, it gave other people who were struggling and challenged, it gave them hope that if so-and-so had that challenge and now they're testifying about this, well, then if God did it for her or if God did it for him, then he can do it for me. And when, you know, from my experience of watching the testimonies and listening to the testimonies, sometimes it will be prominent people, sometimes it will be preachers, sometimes it will be the mothers, sometimes it will be the missionaries. And when they begin to say, well, I used to be in the street and I used to be this, you'd be like, oh, my goodness, mother so-and-so used to be out there in the street? My God, look at how God's using her. It calls the other young women to come forth and say, hey, if God delivered mother so-and-so, let me, let me get my deliverance. <laughs> Let me, you know, let me claim that God's able to do it for me. And that's the power of a testimony. And, and you know, if you hear uh, the, the deacon or the preacher says, you know, I used to be a gangbanger, I used to be on drugs, but look, now God is delivered for me. That gave people hope that, hey, if, if he delivered him, if God delivered him, then truly there's hope for me because I'm challenged with drugs. So the testimony became a powerful element of pain, and we have lost some of that because we no longer um, have those types of, of, of testimony that 
come forth as much as we used to have them come forth. But the Presence Amen. of Praise service used to be, uh, it was the beginning of a deliverance service because after you start hearing the testimony, you start seeing more people coming to the altar with challenges. And I so, I think it's so important that we at the church that we be transparent uh, so that we can help someone because um, that's really what it's really all about. And, and in Galatians 5, it says he that be overtaken in a fault than him that are, are, are strong, you know, we are supposed to help the person. Because sometimes people, they start off with a, a, a situation and then because it's never it's never out, it never comes out, they never feel comfortable enough to ask for help because they feel they're going to be condemned. They've been sitting in church. They, they feel with the Holy Ghost. And I'm talking about fear, fear people that have the Holy Ghost that are challenged in their flesh. But because they don't feel that they can talk about it because of a fear of being uh, ostracized or ostracized or, you know, being sat out or being said you're not saved or being saved that you have to, you know, you can't be a part of this fellowship, whatever it may be, they hold these things on the inside. But it used to be a time when they were saying, hey, if you have this drug problem, all people that's challenged with drugs, come out, let's pray. Or all of those who've ever been hurt by a man, and whatever, but whether it's your father, whether it was a been in service, where they just said that, and you'll be surprised the people that run to the altar, and I mean, people get delivered from that. Uh, and they can't even go into relationships until they, you know, get healed of the things or something that happened or if you're dealing with fear, if you're dealing with drugs or you had this that happened to you, you know. And, it, and you know, then they had altar calls or had services where they called things out so people didn't have to feel alone. So now you had one person go to the altar that said this happened to them, then another person come. And then you get real deliverance, you know. And I think now sometimes people are afraid to confess that they are challenged in their flesh and they sit in the church, and they are bound, and the enemy uses that against them so they can't go forward. And and what happens, after a while, they sit there so long that the thing begins to overtake them, and then Uh they leave the church. And so it's so important that we, as believers, we be sensitive, and we know how to minister and, and also to keep the transparency. And I can appreciate you when you share your testimony and you share different portions, because I believe that people are listening and they do need to know that um, that God is able to deliver, that God is still a healer, that miracles still take place, uh, that your problem is not so strange, that you're the only one dealing with it. People need to know that there is help from, from, from the Lord and that Jesus Christ is the answer, whatever the situation, whatever they're dealing with, Jesus is their answer. And I agree wholeheartedly with you. Uh, I don't want to harp too much on my own personal testimony because I don't think I'm much different than the average or the slightly above average man, and in some cases, woman. Since coming into ministry, since being elevated to the various offices that God has placed me in, don't think for 35 seconds, folks, that I haven't had issues, that I haven't had struggles, that I haven't had problems. The Bible's crystal clear that when it says in Romans ten thirteen, there is no temptation but such as is common to man. The scripture also goes on to say, but God will with that temptation Amen. make a way of escape. And so going escape. back to what I said a little while ago, when we find out that one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, when God makes that way of escape, why are – it's like standing on a track and somebody comes and escorts you off the track. The train is less than 100 feet away, and you turn around and walk right back on the track. What kind of craziness is that? Sometimes people say they want to be delivered, but they – haven't quite convinced themselves that I want the deliverance that I'm asking for. They're trying to get that last taste. They're trying to get that, you know, you ever had a, uh, I don't know what kind of dessert y'all like, but I like banana pudding, okay? And there's that last corner of banana pudding, and I want to get my hands on it before somebody else takes it from me. I'm just saying, hypothetically Mm -hmm. speaking. But, I mean, have you ever had that urge where you had to have it, even though it might cost you a little something? Now, I do want to say this, too. I've been dealing with borderline diabetes, meaning my numbers are slightly higher than they ought to be. But yet I can't pack my body with all kinds of sugar. 
What do you think I'm going to do eventually if I keep packing my body with sugar? Hello, somebody. This is what we yeah. do when we scream, we want deliverance, and yet God provides, and we still find a way to keep doing what we're doing. Talk to me. Amen. I, think that's I agree. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 you're fine. I mean, we, we, we have to make a decision. If deliverance is, and see, I don't want to give anybody an excuse to keep doing what they're doing. All I'm trying to help them is not to become discouraged, to not become dismayed, to not decide to throw in the towel, to not decide to give up, to recognize and realize the more you move forward trying to overcome that which is hindering you, the more God is going to work with you. I know Paul said on three separate occasions in the book of Corinthians, he uh, sought the Lord because of a thorn in his flesh. Paul wanted to be delivered from that thorn in his flesh. He needed to get free from it because it was bugging the daylight out of him. He felt like it was hindering him from being effective in his ministry. I believe he felt like this particular thorn in his flesh was becoming obvious to other people and it was causing a level of discredibility in his ministry. You know how we think, but God turns around and tells Paul, after he asked on three separate occasions to, Lord, let me use the Donald Lawrence slash the Andrea Johnson song. He said, Lord, deliver me. And God turned around and told him what? My grace is sufficient for thee. For in your weakness, grace is made strong. Just a high, uh, paraphrase. Anybody agree or disagree with that? Absolutely. <laughs> and then sometimes he allows your weaknesses to become part of your ministry. Say that again. I said sometimes God, well, I believe, I believe God allows your weaknesses to be part of your ministry. Sometimes. You've got uh, to be able to, like, go ahead. I want to send the police over to Dr. Kim's house. I want to know how she got in my song and, and, and said what she did. Because I'm living with that. <laughs> I wrote a song some time ago called Your Misery Will Become Your Ministry. And that's exactly right. I'm living proof because mm-hmm. he's mm-hmm. using me. <laughs> my weaknesses well, in, in, in school was like writing. Now I love to write. My weaknesses in school was like not talking in front of a crowd, and I love crowds. My weaknesses was also, you know, you know, I was a sex fiend. So now I'm able to help those who have those issues, and it's part of my ministry. I'm not ashamed of what I've been through, but at the same time, God allows your weaknesses to be part of your ministry. And you're right. Your misery becomes your ministry because you become so acquainted with it until the place and point when somebody that's going through what you're going through comes. Now you could share something with them. Listen, I've been dealt, I dealt with that for a certain amount of time, and this is what happened, and this is where I had to go. This is what I had to do. I'm not saying you got to do all this, but I'm just encouraging your heart. Please, don't give up. Stand and fight for what you know is right. Haven't heard from Evangelist Anna Henderson in a while. I think I heard Minister Paula Henderson in the last round. Are you still with us? She in there somewhere. I know she is. I feel it. All up in here. <laughs> but anyway, when you get a chance to get unmuted, come on and talk to us. But listen, I'm I, and we're going to oh sort of kind of cut this just a little bit short tonight. I know it's about uh five minutes past the hour, but you know, every now and then we're gonna have a short session. I 
Really do appreciate all that you guys have brought to the table. Let's look for a solution in this. Paul says in verse 24, reading the Amplified, he says, Wretched and miserable man that I am, who will rescue me and set me free from this body of death, this corrupt mortal existence. Talking about his flesh. He goes on to say in verse 25, Thanks be to God for my deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, serve the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, my human nature, my worldliness, my sinful capacity, I serve the law of sin. Now, Paul isn't saying go out there and willfully sin. What Paul is saying is because it is a process for us to be delivered from that state of sinfulness. We're going to constantly, continuously be in battle with our flesh. Folks, there's a war going on, and there's somebody with a conversation in the background, Sister Kimmy Kim, if they're not talking to us. Okay, I got I got dual. Uh, I don't know how come I got dual, but we're not going to worry about that right now. The bottom line is, you know, we have to understand that Paul is just simply saying we're not making an excuse for you to sin. What we are doing is helping you to understand that it's going to take your efforts along with the power and the anointing and the spirit of God to bring about that change in your life so that that which you used to do, you have no more desire to do. Does that make sense to anybody? Amen. Amen. And I'm thinking about the scripture that says the truth will make you free. And since we know that Jesus is the answer, you know, the more truth you get, the more freer you become. And so um, I'm reminded in in that sixth chapter of Romans when it says, shall we continue in sin that that grace should abound? God forbid. So God, God does not want you to stay in sin. The more truth that you get, the more of the word that you, that you absorb, the more word that you take into your spirit, you read, you hear, you pray. All of that word helps you. The word washes you. It helps you to conform to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, be renewed uh-huh. by, the, by, the, by the changing of your mind. Our minds have to be renewed. And as we continue to sacrifice, so this is a sacrificial way. This is a sacrificial way. And when you're taught that, if this is a sacrificial way to keep giving of yourself. God wants us to burn the always up as a sacrifice before Him. Burn up those flesh and desires. Burn up those things that are not that are not like the Lord. We burn it up and we present it as a sacrifice before His presence and begin to take on and be transformed by renewing our, our minds. And so we continue to renew our minds with the Word of God. How do you get changed? Keep renewing your mind. Keep taking in the Word of God. Keep sacrificing. Keep taking off those things and offering it as a sacrifice to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm giving this up. I'm giving up lying. I'm giving up stealing. I'm giving up doing this. I'm giving up doing that. Now, Lord, I want you to transform me. I want you to give me your truth. I want you to give me, you know, what I need so that I can change. So you have to sacrifice. You have to be willing to take in the word of God, take in truth so God can change you, so God can help you, because it's available. It's available to you. So should we continue in sin? Uh, the, the, the process is not a license to say to continue in sin. The, the process is to let you know that you have help from the Lord as you begin to hate the thing. You have, you have to hate the thing that, that, that's hanging on you that's not right. You have to hate this world. You have to hate the sin that is dragging you under. You have to hate the habit. You have to hate until you hate it. Until you die to it, you have to die to those things. You have to say, I don't like this. I, I, I feel it. You know, I don't want this to be a part of my nature. I don't want this to be a part of my walk with God. You have to hate it. But if you, if you, if you, are, if you don't hate it enough to get rid of it, then you will hold on to it. But you have to begin to say, I hate this part of me. I, I hate getting high. I hate having the hangover. I, I hate misrepresenting Christ and what I'm doing and what I'm saying. I hate it. And when you begin to hate it, you begin to want to get rid of it. The Bible says, kill, you got to kill that old man. you got to kill that flesh and bring it and drag it to the altar and allow God to transform your mind. And it's a, that may be a process, but just keep at it. Just, I want to encourage someone to keep at it. Just keep keep denying it. Keep, keep wanting to get rid of it. Keep hating it. Keep killing it every day. And, and, and don't agree with it and say, this is not who I am. 
don't accept that this is just who I am. Because if it's not like Christ and you're a believer, it shouldn't be who you are because you're supposed to die to self. So it's not who you are. It's who you have allowed to become a part of you. But it's not who God created you to be. So you have to hate the, the thing that God hates and love the thing that God loves. And as you begin to do that, you'll begin to you'll begin to find yourself pulling off those things and, and not having any desire for those things anymore. Um, so it, it, that's the process. That's part of that process. But the truth will make you free. The more words you get, the more you the more strength that you have to be able to win the battle with the flesh. All right. Anybody else? Well, I just want to say that um, I don't believe that God wants us to be anxious about your deliverance, whatever it is that you might be going through, because everyone has a different testimony, but whatever it might be, even the word says, be anxious for nothing, but through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So there are some things that really I believe only God can do. And, yes, you have to be part of the process, but then God still has to be mixed up in that because God is the ultimately, God is going to be your deliverer. And sometimes, um, and I say that it's not just God, sometimes it does just take a simple act of being obedient because I'm thinking about how the children of Israel, when they kept, uh, when they got delivered, then they went back, or they thought about going back. Their mind, they went back in their mind and said, well, we, what about the leeks and the onions and things we used to eat back when we were in Egypt? So, and then right. they kept, then they got into another form of sin and worshiping um, the golden calf. Then, you know, as year after year, they found themselves constantly going back into some type of bondage. And sometimes it is a matter of making up your mind, I'm going to simply be obedient to certain things that you know God is trying to tell you to do and he's impressing upon you. And then you have to, um, you know, sub- give that over to God in prayer and completely surrender unto God. And it is a process. It doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight, but you have to be able to be willing to completely surrender and give it back to God, but not be anxious about it. All right. Anybody else as we come down to a close? Okay. Well, we have spent the last month and a half talking about the process of deliverance. We now come to the point of conclusion or the place of conclusion. And what I mean by that is the ball is now in your court. So from this point on for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to ask whoever can and whoever will. Everybody doesn't have to do it, but if you choose to do it, I expect you to step up as soon as the, the last person finishes speaking. Say what God has placed in your mind, and let's move forward. Uh, solution. What is the solution to the dilemma of deliverance? Talk to me. I'm listening. I simply say, let go. Let go. All right. Let go. Let go. Till you let go. Until you let go, I mean, God cannot. Amen. So he can hold it. He can't remove it. Let go. All right. Anybody else? Well, we have just a couple of minutes. Anybody else? Repeat your question, uh, Bishop, doesn't it? Uh, Basically, now that we've discussed the problem uh, and we've discussed the process of deliverance, I want to close down now with solutions. Share your solutions with the general public. In other words, take it from this perspective. And I know this is going to be a little off kilter, but I'm going to say it this way so you'll understand it. If I were you, finish the sentence. If I were you, I would call on the name of the Lord. I will call out to Jesus because Jesus is the answer. Whatever the situation, 
to you is always the solution to any problem. First, confess. Acknowledge that you need help. That's the first thing is to acknowledge that I need help. I cannot do this on my own. And the Lord said he will hear you and he will answer you. But he is a present help in trouble for whatever the situation. Call on the name of the Lord. And and, and the Lord is there and he is available. He has made himself available for his people. There's nothing too hard for God to do. He's our Savior. He's our deliverer. He's our healer. He's our restorer. Whatever we need him to be, he is that. So there's nothing that we could ever get ourselves into in life that God can't get us out. There's nothing, no sin too deep, no no stronghold too strong that God can't break the fetters and set you free. Whom the Son make free is free indeed. Call on the name of the Lord, and his name is Jesus. Our Savior, hallelujah, our restore. He is our God, and he is and has become our salvation. Amen. Well, I hate the fact that we're coming close to the show because now everybody's waking up. (laughs) All right, anyone else? All right, I'm going to leave it like where it is. And as we had made mentioned before, I mean, you know, let let let, let let's just uh, think in it. Let's let's think like this. Most of us know what it's like to endure a moment of temptation or an hour of temptation, a day of temptation. But when we think back on our example, Jesus Christ, he endured forty days and forty nights. And then coming out, had to face the temptation that the enemy threw at him in the wilderness. We can imagine what the wilderness temptation, you know, is like as three isolated incidents took place scattered over a 40-day period. And we don't really, we know what it's like in some respect, but we don't really know. But in reality, Jesus' time of testing, if you think about it, was nonstop. Now, the Bible said that he was able to secure, S-U-C-C-O-R, secure, in other words, hold steadfast and maintain his position. What is he saying for us? We have not an high priest who was not touched with the feeling of our in. He was tempted by the devil, and Satan got on Jesus like a shirt and refused to let go and refused to leave every step, whispering in his ear, every turn, every moment that he moved, trying to sow doubt and unbelief. My question was, was Jesus impacted by the devil? No, because when you turn around and think about this, Jesus knew and had focus for where he wanted to go. To the individual looking for a solution to be delivered from whatever it is you want to be delivered from, you got to stop focusing on the problem and start focusing on the solution. You've heard three witnesses on this particular radio show stand there and tell you to focus on Jesus. Maybe they didn't use those exact words, but that's what they are saying. And this is what we are encouraging you to do. Turn your focus away from your problem. Stop talking about how bad it is. Stop talking about how you can't get away from it. Start confessing. you got to understand death and life are in the power of the tongue. And my brother and my sister, if you do not know how to properly use your tongue, you will either ensnare yourself or you will deliver yourself. What God needs to do and has to do, God will take care of his part, but God expects you to take care of your part. The first thing you want to do is tame that tongue from negativity. You want to release that tongue from putting your whole spirit and body in bondage. You want to stop being a product of your environment and talking like you're supposed to fit into the fabric of the environment (laughs) to which you're part of. Let go and let God. Let it go. Too many of you are just stuck in your ways. You're stuck in your environment. You're stuck in what you're dealing with. Your deliverance hasn't come because, first and foremost, you've not realized that you're stuck, first of all. Second of all, you're unwilling to let go, as some, as Apostle Smith already said. So as long as you're not willing to let go, stop calling me and asking me to pray for you. 
as long as you're not willing to let go, stop coming up with this piss poor testimony like I've been through the storm too long. As long as you're going to hold on, you might as well go get a raincoat, get a couple of pails so you can throw some of the water out of the boat. Yes. But until you let go, you won't see your deliverance. Yeah, I said it. Now, you're waiting for me to end on a positive note. Here's your positive note. Look unto (laughs) Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. His life was given so that yours could be received and accepted by God. I'm Pastor Ernest D. Richard, Jr. I want to thank my panel, Apostle Vincent L. Smith, uh, Pastor Anna Henderson, Minister Paula Henderson, and uh, Dr. Kim Robinson, and you, the listening audience, wherever you may be. Thank you so much for joining us, and we thank you for being with us during this series. I know we had a couple of breaks in it, but we want to drive home the very fact that it ain't over till God says it's over. You might feel defeated. You might have felt like you lost. You might have felt like you had to take an L. But all you were is just knocked down. You were not knocked out. You may be troubled on every side, but you're not in distress. I'm going to go that far because God is right there waiting to hear you call his name, ask for his help. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. We thank God for each and every one of you. I'm going to ask uh, uh, Apostle Smith if you would just please uh, take a minute to pray us out as we move forward. Well, tonight, Father, we thank you, praise you for this time that we have shared on the air ministry. This word tonight, this discussion, letting people know that even after you have received Jesus, there are still struggles, problems, situations, dilemmas that will come. But Jesus is the answer. He still breaks chains. And cut better. He still knows how to pull out of you that that will not cause you to have a healthy and prosperous walk with him. And so tonight we pray that you will follow the measures that we have tried to set out before you tonight. And if you do, I pray that God will make your life stronger, sweeter, better than you've ever had before. In Jesus' name, amen. Kimmy Cam, hit the music. You guys have a great night. Thank you for joining us. much pain Doing things you told me not to do Lord, I need a healing touch from you So I asked the Lord if he would change my heart A touch from you would provide a brand new
question? Your face, Lord. Lord. 